Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome. This is uh, a video to replace the orientation meeting that many of you will have attended either on Monday or Tuesday. Um, I'm aware that not everyone can make uh, a fixed time that isn't associated with the class schedule, even if there are two options. And so I'm creating this video for those of you who couldn't come to either one of those times. And well, if you're in this category, I hope I'll have a chance to interact with you one-on-one -on -one or in groups uh, in live format pretty soon. And one way to do that is through my office hours, which are Mondays and Thursdays, Mondays at 4 p.m. and Thursdays at 10 a.m. That's when I'm going to log on to that Zoom channel that's linked to the Canvas website. And uh, you can be in a kind of real-time conversation with me there. Also, feel free to ask questions via the email, the messaging function in the Canvas website. Um, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. Um, really excited to teach this class. This is the first online version of a class that I've been teaching for about 10 years. And uh, there are compromises to online education. Everyone knows that. Uh, but for me, there are also distinct advantages. And one of them is that the work that I would normally do standing behind a, a lecture podium, uh, three and a half hours or so per week, delivering stories, telling stories that I care a lot about, but maybe that I've told quite a lot before. Since those are now in video form, I can spend my energy and my time and I can supervise teaching assistants uh, and research assistants to put their energy and time into more um, interactive ways of teaching, into more uh, conversational and dialogic ways of teaching. So I'm really excited to be able to shift this course away from that kind of lecture format and into a format where we're interacting with each other online. Uh, the other thing that's really great about this course that I think I hope will be an advantage is that unlike a lot of other online courses, here the online format is actually an asset. It's actually potentially a kind of a model of the thing that we're studying because we're studying music in popular culture and especially as we move toward the end of the quarter we'll start to think about how social media and uh, how various types of communities especially online communities at the end of the quarter um, interact in order to influence popular music culture and in order to influence what music means to us uh, so I'm excited that our course especially the 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 the, the web aspect of our course can become a kind of a microcosm, a kind of a model. I'm looking forward to thinking of our community as a group of about 350 students and about uh, 10 instructors. I'm looking forward to that community becoming a, a, little, um, a little model of what uh, popular culture does and how, popular, how popular culture works uh, when it influences how we think about music. So I hope that this will be a positive experience um, for everybody, um, not just positive, but really uh, exciting. And um, so also just let me tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. Uh, aside from teaching this course, I'm a composer and a pianist. Um, I uh, have worked as a composer in uh, kinds of um, interactions and ensembles and collaborations that might remind you a little bit of jazz music sometimes and it might remind you of classical music at other times. Sometimes it feels a little bit more experimental. My music is informed by the psychology of rhythm and I study the perception of rhythm. That's one of the things that's really important to me. I also study the way we identify with music. I think about how a social production theory can help us understand something about the shape of a composition and the way that affects our understanding of it maybe as a model for the for the self for who we are and you'll see both of those ideas the perception of rhythm and the way we identify with music you'll see both of them coming up a lot in the way that we talk about popular music one of the things that makes this course different from other popular music courses is that instead of focusing on the intentions of the artists and the musicians which we will talk about to some degree but we'll focus even more on audiences. We'll focus on what audiences do when they make meaning out of music. And I think that's the essence of what distinguishes popular music from other kinds of music, is that we're thinking about what, what do audiences say? What do they express? How do they express something about themselves, their culture, and their time through the music that they choose? Um, and so my work as a musician and as a scholar contributes to that in various ways, but it also makes this a really collaborative course. I am an expert in maybe two or three percent of the music that we'll be studying in this course uh, because it's a vast range of music going all the way back to the early 19th century and all the way up to today. 
And everyone, I think, everyone in this class is deeply passionate about at least some kind of music, or at least you have music that you care about deeply. And for many of you, you'll find yourselves deeply knowledgeable about music in a way, um, specifically specific time, types of music that you love and that you've listened to for years, that I couldn't hold a candle to your knowledge. And so I really love learning from students in this class um, when I get to hear more about the music that you love and get to hear things even about music that I love, but maybe I didn't know before because you might have studied that more carefully than I have. What I have to offer is not necessarily expert knowledge in every single musical style and every single musician. What I have to offer is a framework for thinking about how music works in our minds and how music works in our society. And I hope that becomes a really exciting way for you to, I guess, strengthen your way of talking about music and your way of thinking about your own listening process. Um, for those of you who are UC Santa Cruz students, you might also know that in addition to being a composer, a pianist, and a scholar, that I'm the provost at Kresge College. That's where I am right now, uh, filming this video. Um, I don't know a little bit more about me. I, um, I wrote an opera based on Star Trek, and uh, I write Harry Potter fan fiction. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Obviously, it's not our topic, but if you're curious, you can check out um, Hippogriff Tacos on Twitter. Um, Okay, so my opening lecture, this is not a lecture, this is just me kind of orienting you to the course. Um, and just the last two points that I'll make uh, in this video are just to talk to you about the course learning goals. I've already started to say a little bit about that, but I'll say a little more about the course learning goals. And I'm also um, gonna say a kind of an overview of the course and how it will work, although I think um, you'll get the most of that information just by exploring the site on your own. All right, so let's start with what we're going to learn in this course. As I said, I've already talked a little bit about it, um, but um, we're studying music in this course as a cultural phenomenon. Uh, that means we're interested in music as an expression, as I said before, not only of musicians, but of audiences. And to give you an idea of what I mean by that, let me just play a song, uh, the beginning of a song, and I think you're going to probably, some of you will recognize it, some of you won't. Some of you will be thinking pretty much right away, even with the first few chords exactly, where you've heard that song before and maybe what it meant to you. It goes like this. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Of course, I can't sing like Paul McCartney, and you know that. Uh, but I'm just starting that song out for you because I think a lot of you instantly recognize that song. A lot of you will remember where it came from, and yet some of you may never have heard that song before. And what I want you to contemplate is how different your experience of the opening of that song might be depending upon whether you've heard it before or not and whether you know uh, what it is or not. Of course, that's Paul McCartney singing Let It Be. It's a song on the, the last album of the Beatles produced by Phil Spector. Um, Phil Spector, an American producer who was more associated with girl groups of the early 1960s and uh, associated with the Brill Building pop sound, the kind of post rock and roll teen symphonies they used to call them. And you're gonna learn about Phil Spector in this course and you're gonna learn a little bit about the Beatles in this course. Um, but that's not what I'm uh, here to talk to you about today. I want you to consider that if you think about what Paul McCartney might have intended when he sang and when he recorded that song, he as an artist might have been combining a lot of different influences. He might have been thinking about gospel music, thinking about hymns, some of the religious music of his own childhood, as well as thinking about um, the influences in American music, in country music, and in African American soul music that might have changed the way he would sing those lyrics. Um, uh, that, that certainly develops through the recording of the song, and you can think about him as a composer. You can think about somebody uh, writing a song like that in order to express something very special. Um, and you can read a story about Paul McCartney. You can go online and you can read a story about how he wrote that song and what it meant to him. Um, but at the same time, we can also think about how listeners today might regard that song when they think about it as something that connects them to a certain kind of a musical past. The sound of the music sounds, it sounds a little bit like it comes from a romantic time, something maybe a little bit more romantic and sentimental than the typical music of our time. 
Um, and at the same time, some of us will really relish that nostalgia and will identify audiences, sorry, identify artists in our own time, uh, maybe like Adele, uh, who we think of as maybe trying to follow in the footsteps of McCartney in terms of the types of emotions that they want to express. Now I'm going to leave all that stuff aside, but I want to rec help you. I want I want you to kind of uh, recognize the difference between those two different kind of orientations to the way that you might hear or understand a piece of music. Um, and we're also going to ask in this class, what does music say about the people who love it? What does it say about the audience in CBGB in New York in the mid-1970s? That's a club in the 70s where, where bands like the Talking Heads and Blondie and the Ramones got their start. It's what we really think of as the beginning of punk music in America. Um, what did the audiences care about? Why would they go to a place like that? And what did they expect to hear? How did their choices, and then the later popularization of those choices, how did their choices have an impact on other cultures, other societies, other communities listening in London, listening in France, listening on the west coast of America? Um, and what does it say about those different audiences? Does it say something different about Californians when they listen to New York punk than what it might say about you as a New Yorker? Um, what does it say about our values? Uh, what, um, when we hear uh, the opening of a, of a song that's highly, um, that seems to reflect uh, a place that's distant or different from who we are, far away from the position and far away from our own sense of our own experience. Like if you hear something that comes from a culture unknown to you or a language unknown to you, or if you are a typical suburban, um, uh, middle-class American, let's say maybe you're the children of immigrants living in suburban middle-class Southern California and um, your parents are immigrants but you have a lot of value for the American culture that you've learned growing up and then suddenly you hear uh, a culture that see uh, a music that seems to come from a more working-class background, something that seems to reflect an opinion um, that's or a, a stance on life that's unfamiliar to you. How do you relate to that and how do you value that music differently? How do you find yourself um, either cherishing that music because of what it shows you about another people or perhaps sometimes pushing it away because you kind of want to clarify a little bit um, that that music is not a part of who you are, that that music is somehow, maybe it reflects a kind of person that you don't want to be. And in case you're, you're, you're feeling a little bit like, hmm, what does he mean by that, pushing things away? I don't like to push music away. Um, some people, in fact, when I ask, and when you ask people, what kind of music do you like, one of the most common answers that you'll hear is, oh, I like all music. I like lots of different styles of music. And in the orientation uh, sessions on Zoom, I asked students to comment um, what kinds of music they like. And a lot of people wrote, oh, you know, I like, I like a lot of different styles and I just want it to be good. I like, I like music that's, that's authentic, that's, that seems to come from someone's personal experience. But beyond that, I, I, don't, I don't care what style it's in. And then I reminded everybody that another really common answer to that question is, I like all music except you know what I'm talking about? Fill in that blank there. How many times have you heard someone say, I like all music except, and then there's a blank to be filled in. And I was surprised yesterday to find that the most common uh, uh, way to fill in that blank, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but the most common way to fill in that blank is all music except country music. So what would it be about country music that would have a sort of to love to say, to hasten to say, hey, uh, I'm not into that. Hasten to sort of clarify that that's not me. Um, that might reflect class differences. It might reflect cultural differences in the United States. Um, there have been times, I think they're mostly in our past, but there have been times when the most common way to fill in that blank would have been to say opera or would have been to say hip hop or might have been to say disco. There, there, at different eras in our popular music history, there have been different reasons and different ways that we reject kinds of music. So why do we almost love rejecting music, rejecting certain styles of popular music even more than we love loving uh, or, or attaching our identities to particular styles? That's another question that will, that will kind of come up in this course and we'll be able to think critically about ourselves, think about what it is that we're doing when we use music as a kind of a tool, and this is a key phrase, using music as a tool to help us uh, identify not only who we are, but who we aren't. Um, in order to study all of these things, we need to think critically about the way we listen. 
And so um, we're going to think of music listening as a kind of a craft, as a kind of an art. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a musician, uh, but I actually didn't start becoming a professional musician uh, until I was the age of a first or second year college student. Um, I, I had played music since I was very young, but it wasn't really the main thing that I did um, most of the time when I was growing up. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I started seriously studying classical music and becoming kind of literate in music um, or aspiring to be. Um, so I relate to a lot of you if your primary experience of music is as a listener. And it's always been a deeply held conviction of mine. I really believe deeply that listening to music is something that you can do actively. It's something that you can you, you become a kind of an expressive artist, an expressive musician through the way that you listen, through the way that you hear music, um, and, uh, and not just by making music. So we're going to learn to think about what it means to you when you listen to rhythm, uh, when you listen to melody, when you listen to how a song is put together. And I'm going to teach you some very basic terms to talk about rhythm and to talk about melody and to talk about how songs are put together. Very basic terms. You do not need to know music theory uh, to take this class. You don't need to have a background or to be able to read music or to have experience playing a musical instrument. The terms I'm going to teach you are very basic, but they're just designed to help you describe what you already hear very well in your ears. Um, we're also going to learn to think about how music is produced, uh, how media and technology impact that music, and we're going to learn how to talk about music and express something about what we hear in the music that we love so that you'll become better at talking about what you love about music. I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and again, there's a lot more about that, of course, in the lectures. Um, so uh, a little bit about how the course works. At the top of the Canvas website, I want you to get used to clicking on the Home button, which is in the upper left corner. I guess I should point in this direction, this direction, upper left corner um, of, your, uh, of your web page and when you click on that home button you'll immediately see a page that's essentially a chronology of the course and right now you should only be able to see kind of the first week's assignments because we want you to finish those assignments before you proceed to the next assignments but typically uh, you'll find the course is divided into five units the five units address different issues they're kind of chronological but they also overlap um, and each of those units is two weeks long and as you move through those units uh, the first half of it will be a lot of reading and listening and you'll need to acquaint yourself with music in a variety of different styles and you'll be able to put some time into that. Um, and uh, of course you'll be attending my video lectures during that time and interacting with me in office hours if you need to. And then the second half will often be you then talking back. It'll be you writing a six to eight hundred word listening response to um, a range of optional topics. In each unit you'll have anywhere from four to twelve topics to choose from and you choose only one of them uh, and in that topic you'll write a response to particular songs, particular recordings that you've heard and then here's the key, you'll post that online where your classmates can see it. It's a short three paragraph response to something that you've heard uh, and then we want you to interact with your peers, to go in and talk to your peers, um, ask them questions about what they heard Tell them when you disagree. Tell them when you think a little bit differently than, the, than they do or when you heard something different from what they heard. Um, and so you'll be getting, uh, in a given unit, you'll get about 16 points for your initial response and then another four points for the quality of the discussion that you pursue in those threads under those um, listening responses. Um, um, and you can see the breakdown of the grades in the syllabus there. Um, and then as you complete each unit, the other units will open up to you. Um, we have a midterm scheduled for February 21st at 7.30, 7.30 to 10.30 p.m. Um, that's around the end uh, of Unit 3. And then we have a final exam scheduled for March 21st at 7.30 p.m. The tests do require you to pay a $12 fee. I didn't feel great about setting that fee up. Um, but I hope um, it's an understandable and um, a pr it's, a, it's a fee that you can manage. A lot of courses like this, uh, I don't need to tell you, would have $175 worth of textbooks or maybe even more uh, that you'd have to buy. There are no textbooks to buy in this course because I've, I've assembled the reading from current scholarship and current journalism on popular music. 
um, changing it a little bit every year in order to try to reflect uh, what the best knowledge is on the topics that we're studying. Um, that makes the course interesting and challenging and hopefully also affordable. So I hope you'll understand that we do need those $24 fees in order to, what we do with those fees is we end up, we have the exam taking proctor situation. So instead of sort of cattle herding you all into a big lecture hall where TAs would sort of walk around uh, peering over your shoulder as you fill out uh, multiple choice forms, uh, you'll invite a proctoring, sort of a third party to proctor and sort of be able to follow what you're doing online and I know that might seem a little bit invasive but um, it's very similar to being proctored in real life and then that service switches off as soon as you're done with the exam and that's how we make this online education possible. Um, great so um, well I'll just finish by saying I'm really excited and uh, thanks a lot for um, joining the course and for joining me in what's going to be the first time that I really get to conduct a conversation like this. So I hope um, we have a great time and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.